They always say that magic comes back to you three times fold. So if you're putting negativity out there, negativity will be built up and put down. And if you're no longer here to reap that type of chromatic darkness, it will wreak havoc on those that you facilitate or love the most or mm -hmm. in this line of uh, family lines. So once you open that Pandora's box, it's just finding the right person to be able to seal it off and close it, you know? And how do you do that? You find a, a practitioner who's somebody who works in the lighter side of that same doctorate of magic. And you work with them to go ahead and seal Pandora's box that was opened by her grandfather. So you would work with someone directly in line with the same type of magic, but it does go back to the same thing about magic comes with a price. Magic will come back to you three times fold. Right now on Higher Journeys with Alexis Brooks. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to Higher Journeys. I am, of course, your host, as usual, Alexis Brooks. <laughs> welcome back to the show. Always good to have you here and always good to welcome a new guest, which I am delighted to bring to you today. Her name is Raquel. I'm going to bring her on in a moment. She is, well, first of all, I'm going to say she's a friend. I, you know, I just love making new friends and I think I got a new one today. Well, we've been talking for a while. So Raquel and I are going to be diving deep into the world of karma. We're going to be talking about ancestral healing and ancestral, uh, well, wounds as well as healing. We're also going to go into what we loosely call ancestral curses. I hasten to use the word, but it's something that you're probably familiar with. Um, and there, there's a lot that we can do in terms of working with that energy as well. This is all about healing. Uh, I'm so glad that Raquel is here. She is, of course, brought to us, all of us, by our friends at Psychic Source. So thank you, Psychic Source, for having Raquel. And Raquel, I'm bringing you on the screen right now. Welcome, my friend, all the way from L.A. and earthquake-ridden L.A., huh? How are you doing? Welcome. And how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. It's, you know what, as much as we suffer from earthquakes here, um, occasionally, actually a little bit more frequently lately, um, mm -hmm. it's still a beautiful part of the country and it's gorgeous and sunny and wonderful. So always very grateful to greet everybody from sunny Southern California. Yeah. And hi everyone. I'm so happy to be here to represent Psychic Source today. And I'm, so I'm excited about our conversation. Well, you know, we had a great chat, what, about a week or so ago, Raquel, and we knew we were going to do a show on uh, this idea of karma. It's a loaded term, and I think it's got a lot of innuendo, uh, but we kind of went down that rabbit hole of, okay, we're going to talk about that, but we obviously don't want to talk about it in a vacuum. We want to talk about it as it connects uh, to uh, to healing, particularly. How do I identify it? How do we use the term loosely, burn it off? What is it really? And then we started down this rabbit hole of talking about how it may be linked to, for lack of a better word, for uh, the sake of argument, we'll call it ancestral curses or curses and how they happen. And most importantly, how to identify and heal them. So we got a lot of territory to cover. But before we even go there, I want to know a little bit about your story, because I know you've got quite a story in terms of your legacy uh, as a, a, a spiritual advisor and the clients that you work with. Tell us a little bit about how this all started for you. Well, it started for me at birth. I'm actually born a medium. My mother was a medium. Um, my brother, Ricky, um, who's also on Psychic Source, he's also a medium too as well. We huh? would dominate him as an evidential medium where I'm an empathic medium, which means I work with emotions. And I was trained from a very young age by our mother who was extraordinary with psychometry and tarot and she was an incredible medium and just a very vivacious creature by nature. Um, and she really kept my dreams alive. And I've always been very, uh, never been hesitant about ghost stories or seeing ghosts or communicating. And so I've kind of elevated myself into the idea of the medium and also seeing and passing on messages because I always felt like there was such peace given to people if you're able to close that last communication gap you know, between the living and the dead and really provide that type of essence of calmness for people while they're grieving. So I did study abroad um, following in my brother's footsteps. And one day my brother was like, why are you not doing this to help people on a larger platform and scale? And so he really um, pushed me to excel and become a full-time spiritual advisor that I am now. And I'm so grateful for Psychic Source and connecting me with some amazing people that mm -hmm. I really created really um, wonderful, you know, connections with. And I'm very honest with my clients who I really feel a very 
resourceful, deep spiritual connection and balance with them mm -hmm. to make sure they're excelling in their existence, you know? Beautiful. And I feel like some days it's hard to stay grounded when you're dealing with a lot of grief, you know, but then you have that reading the next day that reminds me that, yeah, it reminds yourself how profound your gift is and how much peace you're able to bring somebody. And those are the ones that really keep me focused and keep me growing and keep me wanting to excel further in these gifts and the dynamic of just spiritual advisement, but also making sure I can give them concrete benefits that will help them excel in their own life and also break through their grief or whatever it is that they're working through so that they can find hope. And I feel like hope leads to joy at all costs. Oh, absolutely. Well, I would say uh, you brought a lot of people joy being at Psychic Source for what, close to 10 years? And you've done, <laughs> I think I heard or uh, read over 50,000 readings, really? How do you deal with taking on all of that energy, Raquel? This is, let's start with this in terms of, um, well, not, not absorbing too much of it, because you're dealing with a lot of different life issues. How do you scale that off? Stay that I off? I feel like it's the whole thing about like, you know, self help at the end of the day, you know what I mean, where you really take care of yourself and you. Um, so personally, for me, exercise, I have mm -hmm. a very extreme, like not extreme exercise regimen, I'm just very yoga, Pilates, walking, anything that keeps me active, because that's how I personally meditate. A lot of people can sit and meditate in the and I'm absolutely all for it. I'm an active meditator, I need to be out walking, I need to be active, it helps me put me into a deep space, you know. And then of course, there's, you know, salt baths with Epsom salt really help too as well. Uh, sage, different variations of sage, I use sweet grass, which is lovely to kind of expel negative feminine energy that might get stuck around you mm -hmm. white sage. so i have a and charging with crystals i have a little bit of a regimen and a routine that i do throughout the week to help me dislodge some negative energies that can get stuck to you pretty intensely because when you care so much about somebody and every person i speak to i i have this really deep established connection with because i feel their fears their wounds their their hurt and so i connect with them and sometimes they get lodged in me too as well, yes. not just because I am that empathic person, but also because I, I, I care, you know? So mm -hmm. I find that sometimes I have to remove myself from the energy field and just be Raquel the human, not Raquel, as my son calls me the superhero, which mm -hmm. I think is adorable. He says, that's my mom's superpower. And, oh. you know, so I feel like sometimes we have to be, I guess, the Clark Kent to the Superman. I'm not Absolutely. saying that I'm that much, you know what I mean? That's just what my son equates me to, which I, feel I love like it. Well, it it so. It's it's quite a balance, uh, Raquel, particularly, I, I I don't think I even had to ask if you were an empath or not, but just by virtue of what you do, uh, I am, I always say, I don't wear it as a badge of honor. It is what it is. And I know a lot of our audiences as well, and it can present both a gift and I won't say curse, just a challenge of balancing because we are so um, habituated toward taking on all sorts of energies where it's, it can be difficult to even know what's yours, what's not. And if you know, it's not yours, how do you distance yourself from it? But that's another conversation for another day. That's a lot. No, trust me. That's I a lot. The empath out there has to decide what's theirs and what's not. And that had to be the hardest thing as growing up as an empath is dealing and treating what is actually something you can deal with which is your own situation mm -hmm. as opposed to somebody else's so that mm -hmm. separation is such a fine line you know yeah, so, it is indeed. and you know it's okay to call it a curse because i feel like as much as we don't like the word because it's the negative it can be because it's very it can be very paralyzing to someone's existence when they're oh. dealing with somebody else's anxieties yeah no question about it and because there's so much anxiety from so many different directions today it can be overwhelming, but uh, well, this is not too dissimilar to what we're going to be getting into. We're going to get into some hard stuff, guys. We're talking about karma. We'll, we'll open with that. And, you know, as I was, we're all familiar with the term, right? And it does have a connotation that can be a bit uh, dark or unfriendly. I think you use the word, even though, or the term, even though karma is not necessarily your friend, it can be a mentor. I love that. That's what, that's what Raquel said. But, it, you know, look, let's, in terms of breaking down what uh, what karma is, we know it is a Sanskrit term uh, that literally means uh, an action or deed, and it's related to cause and effect. But it's so much more than that, Raquel. I would love for you to really get into your understanding of what karma is, and then we'll go a bit deeper into uh, perhaps how karma can be, let's say, bleed over uh, into 
multiple incarnations. But first, from your perspective, what is karma? How do you understand it to be and to work? Well, for me, karma is a structural balance, right? It's a it's a way for us to really kind of structure how we're going to behave or how we're going to believe what we what legacy we're going to leave here moving forward. And I believe I said that, like you just said, that karma necessarily isn't your friend, but it is a mentor. It's a way of kind of elevating yourself into being a better person and being a better route and making those decisions that are going to affect not just your future, but also the future of somebody else's life that you're actually touching at the same time. If you wound somebody, that does wound them and it wounds their legacy as well as your own. So I figure if we're looking at karma as a legacy, what are we leaving behind? What are we in the ether and how do we affect people? But also how do we affect ourselves too as well in our own healing and growing journey? So karma is a way of creating balance in our future, but also not for our future, but our future generations and also the generations of the people that we come in contact with as well, because we leave a mark. Our energy is left no matter where we are. Hmm. So karma is an energetic reminder that we want to put out positivity and to help people thrive and help ourselves thrive in everything that we do. So I believe karma is a mentor because it makes us structurally more sound and better. So mm -hmm. there is a balance. Everything has a negative when there's a positive mm -hmm. good to an evil at all, at all costs. I don't believe karma is anywhere in the evil area, you know, but I feel like if we weaponize karma, it still comes back to bite you. You know, if we wait to see, how something's going to happen to somebody. We're not growing. We're just kind of stagnant and staying. And if we're not moving, we're not healing. So no matter what, the negative karma that we wish on somebody else is still sticking with us at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my quick summarization right. of what it means to me. We've also heard karma on occasion used in a positive context, good karma as an example. In fact, I, I was thinking of a, a young lady that I've known for a year. She's uh, a, a friend's uh, almost like, adopted daughter, if you will. And her name is Karma. That's a name that that's not too unpopular, at least at some point it was. So, so when I was thinking about that, I'm like, I, I'm sure the mother did not name her Karma thinking of it as a bad thing. But there is this inference of there, there can be good Karma. Yes, absolutely. But that's what I'm talking about. Like putting positivity into the world is good Karma and it will return to us what you put out and what you put into a recipe, if you use quality ingredients in a recipe, you're going to get a quality product, mm -hmm. right? So I feel like yeah. we can put that into a very tangible way because sometimes karma can be used in the ether too much, too much air without enough tangibility, you know? I love that. That if we, if we use the right ingredients and we use, you know, fresh tomatoes as opposed to rotten tomatoes, it's what you're going to get at the end, right? Absolutely. Your finished product. So karma as a tangible, tangible item is a recipe. I love that analogy. And it seems so simple. And yet, why is it that so many struggle with using rotten tomatoes and rotten apples and bad ingredients to, to carry the analogy further? Let's touch on that. You know, what, where is this temptation of doing not great things coming from, from your perspective and reaping that karma, perhaps not being aware of the damage that it's doing to yourself? I feel like if we are looking in the construct of ego and what really works well for us at that time and what makes us feel strong. And I feel like lower self-esteem or lower areas in that area, we try to climb on people to make ourselves better. And when I say we, I'm not just saying you or me or anybody else. I'm just using it as a, like just a base of structure. But if we climb on people to make ourselves feel better, we're actually hurting people in that essence. So that's where a bad karma thing would come into play. You know what I mean? So I feel like ego is the biggest part that generates bad karma because we might want to show display a power. We want to control. There's narcissism. There's that type of what kind of economic gain can I get from somebody else? You know what I mean? And we're not mm -hmm. actually sharing. We're keeping everything for us. So I feel like I would be a very, you know, a way to say negative karma when I'm just thinking about the I as opposed to the us or the mm -hmm. we. Mm -hmm. You know, so I feel like it's a very selfish thing that um, people stand on to make themselves feel better by taking down somebody else's um, esteem. But this has been taught. Let's get a little controversial for a minute, Raquel. You know, you and I can go there, right? Let's let's yeah, talk okay. about the indoctrination. And this is no accident. You know, there 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 are lots of conversations going on now about sort of this revealing of um, 
the, the programming of the masses for for good reason, you know, a, mm -hmm. a playbook that's been around for perhaps thousands of years. So let, let me get your comments on that. We won't harp on that, but you know, again, uh, the, what you're mentioning is you know daily business, and there are a lot of people that are that can say I'm actually proud of it. Remember the phrase uh, "greed is good" as an example. How did but that enter? You know, it's interesting, the idea of like greed is good. Um, it doesn't seem like it feeds the masses. You know what I mean? Like it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it helps oneself. Greed is a place of cultivating wealth for a singular, as opposed to, I feel like good karma would be more towards being able to generate, to secure others. Right. At the same time. right. You know, like for yourself and then your family. Right. But what I'm saying is the whole fact of promoting uh, the repetition of greed is good came from somewhere. Now, what we're talking about is that type of attitude is obviously, to me, would be developing not good karma because you're gaining that greed on the back of somebody else. You're hurting somebody else. So let's see if I can make it clear. What I'm saying is the the very idea of these sort of these phrases that are put into our vernacular our society come mm -hmm. from somewhere and that the the place where it's coming from could it be that they understand the metaphysics of karma on purpose do you understand what i'm saying oh no i to, completely understand yeah the yeah. i feel like it is a very um intense vernacular to be put out there that you know you work hard you you pay off but when we're looking at hard work i feel like it's it's kind of put in a way of a more like a positive area where building on others or climbing on others is, is a good deed. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's because, what I'm saying. They've, they've yeah, caught benefit. that. It's okay. Well, it's, it's okay because we're working for somebody else's benefit at the same time. You know what I mean? And I feel like greed as a structure eventually implodes. Exactly. That's my point. Exactly. And that's somebody who, who, whatever force, put that out into the masses to adopt, I think, understands the metaphysics of that. Mm -hmm. And that that person will implode if they don't really know what's going on, even though it's promoted as something for you. It's actually undermining uh, who you are as a as a, you know, individual made of love. Anyway, yeah, I think we're saying the same thing, maybe in a slightly different way. But yeah, yeah. I feel like we're just kind of like rounding around the same table. Yeah, but it's, I, I feel like I yeah, no, I completely understand where you're coming from in the contracts of where the greed is good comes from. I just I feel like from what I'm picking up spiritually and also from my own knowledge of it is that greed serves the one. It doesn't serve the all. Oh, absolutely. I concur 100 percent. Yeah. So that was not a good thing to put out there. Greed is oh, no. good and having people repeat. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> people no, are I dropping. Really bad. I feel like we're on the same page here. It's not it's not a positive thing to done be on purpose, though, here. is what I'm it's saying. It's done on so. purpose to make to kind of infiltrate the mind that this is how things are done. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. if more people say it, then it must be true. But just because right. more people say it doesn't mean it's absolutely true. It just means more people are following a doctrine that may not be beneficial to the whole of humanity, you know, on 100%. a spiritual sense, but also on a, just being a human sense too, as well. And what we, you know, right. what we may owe to each other, or maybe, you know, we don't owe something to each other, but how do we live harmoniously and great right. good is not the a answer. way of doing that. <laughs> no, I, I mean, we... personally, that's not the way that I like to associate yeah. my life with. Right. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> Let's take the karma discussion, Raquel, um, down the path of previous incarnations. We're talking about past life karma. Mm -hmm. How much do you get that coming up in the readings that you do? And go into that a bit more in terms of how prevalent it is that that karma can be passed down through our own individual incarnations. You know, I feel like when I deal with clients or we go into the nitty gritty of why they feel a certain way, why they have certain fears, why they have certain reoccur reoccurring nightmares or, you know what I mean, or feeling like they're not lucky in certain ways. Sometimes I will delve into a past life area and we'll go into a little bit more into the territories of what may have occurred and what could be the reoccurrence in each lifetime. And that's probably about 50% of my reading. Some people are more specific on this life and some people want to grow out of what's going on and stop the repetition and actually find out what they're supposed to heal. So 
25 to 50 percent, I believe, like in that area, we actually will go into past lives. And when we go into past lives, I always look for the pattern. What is the pattern? What was the significant instance that may have caused that type of karmatic um, damage or repercussion that needed to be fixed? You know, and mm -hmm. how many lives back are we looking? What do we need to do right now to focus on? And a lot of it really has to do more with karmatic healing than it has to do with karmatic justice. You know, I feel like there's a lot of things when it comes down to the idea of healing and justice are very two different areas, you know. Can you elaborate yeah. on that? Okay. So chromatic justice is basically you did something really, really obviously pretty bad in a previous existence that's haunted you throughout. And so you have to recognize it and change the pattern. You have to take this time, exile that narcissism or whatever it is that made you or your spirit at that time act the way you did. And we completely curtail that activity and that mindset and we grow and we have to in order for us to grow this is where they kind of come together with the justification of like healing and growing we have to really kind of accept what we did learn from what we did and change what we did and make an effort to make something better because of it even though it might have been multiple lifetimes back if we can make a difference now in that same route then we can actually clear that karmatic damage. So that's when we go backwards. So that'd be like karmatic justification. Karmatic healing is more that something was done really bad to you and you're still trying to get through whatever hurt and damage was um, put on you certain lives back. And then we take it and we learn from it and we grow out of it. So we kind of delve deep into that insecurity and we work with it and we work on programs on how to heal from it, whether it be journaling, writing, meditation, you know, accepting it, you know, and then we can actually start to grow and learn out of it. So we no longer have to deal with that karmatic healing in the next existence or mm -hmm. later on in our own life. So we're just kind of stopping the pattern. So both of them are stopping patterns, whether it's healing to grow or accepting to grow and making the changes necessary for you to live in a more peaceful, serene existence. Mm -hmm. So we're here to challenge our own personal growth. We're here to challenge our own personal healing. And in doing so, acceptance and is the major part of it, whether it's a negative or a positive, no matter what, we have to accept the accept the bad, accept the deed, and heal from it and make a change. Mm -hmm. If we don't change, we're gonna make the same mistakes. Absolutely. But here's the here's the rub, I guess, for me, at least for some people, probably many not even realizing that the pattern that they're going through that's undesirable may come from a previous existence, that it may be a karmic uh, pattern. So how would one, I mean, because look, there, there are people that have awful patterns. Can we 100% of the time assign them to a karmic deed? Or do some people just because of environment, because of culture, a number of things have these bad patterns. So how would one be able to say, aha, this is, there's, there's more to this than meets the eye. In other words, that it's karma that's uh, playing out for me in this life. I feel like a lot has to do with the parallels between this existence and this life and going through our own personal therapy and healing. If we really want to make a difference, we're going to delve into our past realistically and honestly. If we sugarcoat our past and say, oh no, I didn't do any of that, then we're not accepting. So once again, it goes back to acceptance again. Um, and if we go through our existence and we're like, this doesn't make sense for for me as I am, regardless of, you know, how it was brought up or where I'm now and where, what growth I've had, what is my blockage, you know? And if we can't find an answer here, then sometimes working with somebody um, who is a medium or a hypnotherapist with any type of like past life regression can definitely help resolve those instances. But I feel like it is about, we have to kind of make sure that it's not something on this existence that we're right. on, paralyzing us in the future. So I feel like we start in the now in this life and work our way backwards. Work it's our way backwards. Working our way backwards. And if it stops at birth and we're not finding the area, then we may have to go back. So that is something that um, people can definitely work with hypnotherapy um, mm -hmm. or with a medium um, or reader who is proficient in past life regression. Mm -hmm. So you find someone who actually is well geared in those areas. Not all psychics do it. Um, psychic is such an umbrella term. I like to tell people there's so mm. many different, um, wonderful variations of gifts, astrology, numerology, you know, you know, telepathy, you know, it's, it's such an interesting area in my vortex is just right in this corner. I like as just yeah, tell us more about the, the, the style of readings that you do. I know that you, you were considered all the Claire's sentient, <laughs> clairvoyant, clairaudient, 
Uh, but tell us some of the other tools that you use. We are living at a time when answers to life's biggest questions are crucial, making clarity and understanding essential for a better tomorrow. Many seek support and guidance to bring awareness to their otherworldly encounters in addition to life's day-to-day -day challenges. What do these experiences tell us about the nature of reality and of the self? To unlock a deeper understanding of your journey and discover answers to your most pressing questions, connect with one of the many compassionate psychic advisors at Psychic Source. As the oldest and most reliable psychic network, Psychic Source offers a variety of advisors with diverse spiritual gifts, tools, and reading styles. You'll find energy healers, intuitives, empaths, mediums, channelers, and even pet psychics. Whether it's a tarot or astrology reading, or you want to develop your own psychic gifts, Psychic Source is here to help. Right now, for the Higher Journeys audience, new customers get a 30-minute reading plus five extra minutes for just $20. Celebrate Psychic Source's 35th anniversary with 35 minutes for only $20. Just click the link provided or go to PsychicSource.com and be sure to use the promo code Alexis for this special introductory offer. Psychic Source offers 24-7 service via phone, video, or chat. You decide. The time is now to discover your answers. Let Psychic Source help you trust your tomorrow. Well, I do use tarot as long as it doesn't conflict with a person's beliefs. They, you know, it's kind of listed. I, they can be like no tools whatsoever. Tarot to me puts out a picture. Um, a lot of the time I connect Im immediately empathically to the person's voice, which I love voice, even though I do do chat too as well, um, just to connect with that energy. And I just kind of delve right on into everything anything and everything. I like to use every tool that is at my disposal, whether it's, you know, audible and I hear the words or, you know, I see it and a lot of feeling comes through with it where I'm just all of a sudden, I just feel the urge to say, no, stop what you're doing. Or this person's not good. You mm -hmm. know, I just, but I also, sometimes I pause in the reading because I want to make sure I'm getting all the information and then I'm going to put it into words and get it out there. So it's just a, it's a value of gifts, I guess. Absolutely. So would you say, Raquel, that when you're sitting with someone, and a lot of times it's remote, obviously, do the tools that you need emerge as you sit with the person, you'll know what you need? Oh, absolutely. I feel like I'm guided by their guides um, through mine that tell me how I'm supposed to to read. And there's been times where I've been doing tarot where I'm told to read it backwards, which was a very interesting, you know. What do you niche. mean? backwards so if there's like a general spread you you read it like a book you know you read it from left to right and this one told me to read it left to right so i was actually reading the cards from back to front as opposed to the other direction that you would normally read them depending on what kind of spread you're putting out there but i was instructed to read it a certain way or i'll be instructed to put down three more cards it's just this instinct that comes in me that says you need to do this and from what i've learned from doing readings is the first thing i have to do is really value the trust that i have with my connection with spirit so when they're communicating i don't question it i just kind of go right into it mm -hmm. i listen they say this is the direction we're going and i say absolutely this is what we need to do whether um the client is looking for that reading or not at that time i'm just i'm just uh -huh. the voice of spirit and they want you to know a certain thing at a certain time so yeah. So the tools will come up. They'll say, oh, you know what? This person would love runes or this person would love for you to just go straight into it. Or they want you to speak to a loved one that's there. And I'll say, oh, wow. maternal grandmother is coming in and she's very direct. And she was like this, this and this. She's saying to do this, you know, so it really just depends what the person needs. And I just kind of tailor my reading based on what spirit is telling me that the person needs and how they need to hear it. Some people need compassion and very light and some people need extraordinary directness where mm -hmm. it is, no, you're not listening. You need to do it this way. And it's not because I'm trying to be mean or harsh or anything like that. It's just that that's how spirit is telling me that they will listen. And if they listen, that generates hope. And once again, hope leads to joy. So yay. Um, so there is a pattern to my madness and how I how I work, but it is tailored towards the person's energy and how at the time I'm being instructed to to read for the person, what tools to use, what tools not to use, or just go straight into it, you know, and mm -hmm. not necessarily what they want to hear, but what they need to hear. So. We're getting a little off topic when it comes to <laughs> karma, but that's okay because yeah. all of it's just so exciting. This whole landscape, and my audience knows that I'm by f not by any stretch a, uh, a pr 
proficient in these things, but I love to shuffle myself. I don't do, I have to, I own Tarot, but I like to play with Oracle and um, yeah, I just love that process. Um, now, of course I lost my train of thought, but here's what, here's what I want to ask you. That'll come, the, the other thing will come back if it's supposed to. Can you give us an example of a story or, or a reading that you've done, obviously without divulging any uh, too many personal details that really threw you for a loop? In all the years that you've done readings, over 50,000 just for Psychic Source, can you share a story with us that really surprised you? Put oh, you spot. That's, a, that's a big question. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going through the different readings. I mean, I can definitely... Um, I feel like there's a lot of ones that are very impactful to that. I mean, I don't know if it's proper to answer the question, but everything I'm picking up right now is just what really was through me for loop and really impacts me is when I'm able to secure somebody in a very hopeless environment, you know, mm -hmm. and I can snap them out of that. I can have them come back from the ledge, you know, mm -hmm. and then hear about their successes three years later. I know it's completely off topic on the subject, but those are the ones that really kind of like, hit me in the feels and do kind of make me step back and think, wow, that's, that's super impactful and amazing mm -hmm. that I'll be able to really kind of pull somebody off a ledge. And, you know, I yell at people to put the gun down. I've, I've done that. It's, it's a very intense situation. And then to hear their success stories later. Um, I feel like that's, that's several of my clients, but um, those ones are the ones that I feel like do kind of stop me in the loop and realize why I'm here. And I know that's probably off the question you're kind of going for, but they were really, those are the ones that really, I don't know. Those are the ones that stand out for me the most, but I can't think of one that just kind of like threw me for a loop except for like, you know, <sighs> I'm just going through, there's a lot. There's a I'm lot. sure there's a lot. Well, over 50,000 like readings there has to be. Okay. So, but, so um, you're, you're dealing with individuals again, Raquel, I don't, you, obviously, you don't want to go into too much personal detail, but individuals that wanted to check out where you had to wa talk them through changing their mind. Absolutely. Right. Talk them through going from like a hopeless situation into, hey, let's go ahead and reevaluate this. You're not done here. This isn't your time. And right. to really kind of like grasp them back. And the biggest joy to me, and it still makes me cry sometimes just thinking about when I hear from these people five, six, seven years later and how amazing they're doing. And now we're talking about other subjects, how I remember that they had that gun in their hand, you know, how they were ready to call it. And they were reaching out to me for either help or that it's okay for them to go because I'm a medium and work with the dead and work on the other side. You know what I mean? Or they were just, they were just trying to have their voice heard one more time by somebody and mm -hmm. that made them feel like they matter, you know? And so their voices, they still echo in my head. And every time I'm I get sure. an updated reading from them, it's amazing. So, I mean, I've definitely had a lot of like, interesting situations with interesting questions. Absolutely. But I'm no judgment here. I go through all of them, but of course, you know, like I said, I know it's, it's, it doesn't make me stop and stare and be like, Oh my God, what's going on here. It just kind of makes me jump into action and be like, this is let's do this. And to see their futures unfold in such a positive area is everything. So um, yeah. A little off topic topic on that one, but I was just trying important, to think. Important though. I'm glad it came up. That's so important. Well, you know, we had Robin on from from the network, yes. from the source. Yes. And uh, of course, I shouldn't say of course, but no surprise, this idea of desperation and, and, and depression and wanting to check out, that was actually a major theme of our conversation. And so I can only imagine right now, particularly with the, with the stresses becoming exponential, <clears throat> that you might be getting more clients that are in that space. Not all, but uh, far too many. But th thank God for people like yourself and Robin who are able to um, breathe new life or remind, re literally reconnect the mind of, of life and uh, purpose. So I salute you for that. Exactly. Well, I mean, if I'm going to tell one quirky story, um, if somebody, um, I did a mediumship reading for a woman who, um, who lost her husband and, uh, he was the most hilarious person I've ever met in my life. Um, and I call him a person because he's still a person. They're still human. They're still spirit, you know, um, to the point where we established such a connection that I was grilling one day and he told me that I had the grill too hot. 
<laughs> out of the reading outside. I am just cooking, living my best life. And he came up to me and was just like, you know, you have the girl too hot. And so I told her that. And she was like, that's, that's my man. Sure. That's, that's my husband. So that was her validation through my own resource of just having him pop up in a reading or not even a reading, just grilling food for dinner. And mm. for him, my girl was too hot. I thought it was really, really funny. And I couldn't wait to reconnect with her to tell her like, sure. The way he said this and she's like that's him bar none that's him that's Enough that's said him. right said oh that was it any validation she needed after that and that was after the first reading to the second reading and i had already given him given her some validation but that the criticism of the cooking was her way of knowing that that was her husband. that's all she needed that's and all she needed to and you it was, and it was right. completely off reading i i feel like it was a couple days later but i recognize spirit as i would recognize a person i'm like oh hey how's how's it going you know what i mean i saw you last week come come in and sit down she'll be here in a minute you know what i mean that, that's how i recognize spirit so i thought it was very cool that so off the call off of work he came in and decided to say hi so, so. you're you are you, you carry all of the claire's so clairvoyance of course is seeing do you tend to see the discarnate as human beings in front of you or have you Yes, I have. And it's so exciting to me. It's so thrilling. Um, I've seen them full on where they are like a full structure where you think you can touch them, you know, and I've seen them in the way that they're very like, you know, translucent and you can see right through them, you know, um, pop up occasionally through the eyes, you know what I mean? They get your attention. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the time it's a little bit more in the mind's eye where I can feel the person into the room, but I can't see them but I know they're there and I know what they're doing as if I'm watching them do it, but I feel it. I'm like, oh, he just sat down right over there because I know someone sat down behind me, kind of like you would know. So that's like a very like clairsentient area of it where you're just kind of like feeling the area of it, you know, where clairvoyant you've seen. And clairaudient is like when you actually hear the person mm -hmm. speak. And the most fascinating one to me had to be my sister when she came in to, uh, my sister passed away when I was nine. And one day I was sitting and uh, I heard her say my name and I felt the wind and the hot air on my ear. Nobody was in the room, but I felt her come in the room and then she whispered in my ear. And so that's my favorite Clara audience ever on a very personal note. But I've definitely heard people yell or scream or tell me messages audibly. And to me, I just kind of like throw it out there. I also try to catch it because I'm also a ghost hunter. So of course I also try to catch it on like electronic devices to try to like prove to myself that I'm not crazy. But, you know, I feel like if I'm telling a sitter, this person just said this in this accent, in this tone, this is their voice. Um, that also is a massive level of validation. So that's how I use like Claire audience. Mm -hmm. um, I never really know what Claire is going to come up in a reading. It really just depends, depends on the person's communication style um, or the spirit's communication style you know, and how they're able or what their capabilities are to get their message across. Feeling empathically, I feel like it's the easiest way for them to send energy. So for me to feel mm -hmm. someone died, their their pain, what they're feeling at that time emotionally, also physically is a lot of the times how I'll do um, validation in a reading too as well. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. It yeah, of course, bad. there's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot. I want to get a question from one of our members, Suzanne, but I, I, I want to get back I'm going to park this and Alexis, okay. you're going to remember you notice how she casually slipped in that she's a ghost hunter. Hmm. I think we need to go there. Okay. Let me get this question in from Suzanne. Hi, Suzanne. Always great to hear from you. Here's a question she has about karma and it's a little bit long, but I'll, I've actually shortened it a bit. She says, I do have a question about karma. I've been pondering whether we have the ability to circumvent karma and its cords through forgiveness work. Personally, I'm not interested in an eye for an eye. I'm focused on doing my best in each moment and offering myself and others grace and forgiveness. My practice has been very much on the order of the principles of Ho'oponopono, mm -hmm. period. I'm wondering if this type of practice neutralizes karma, allowing it to be transmuted back into source energy. Ho'oponopono. And by the way, the only reason why I know how to pronounce that is because I once narrated an audio book where that was in there like five times. So <laughs> I hope I said it right. <laughs> it, it, it sounds correct to me. And I actually really love that philosophy on curtailing um, karma by adding a level of forgiveness too as well, because I feel like that's a massive component in karma. You know, um, when you're, when, so I'm, I'm taking this as somebody's in, 
inflicted pain on you and you're able to offer that forgiveness and grace to them so that hopefully they'll learn from it. I feel like that does help them. You know, it may alleviate the karmic justice, I guess you can say, but I also feel like maybe I'll just teach in a little bit more knowledge to the person who offended, you know, by offering that type of forgiveness. And I feel like that also cleanses our tie to that person by releasing any type of negativity that might be ushered in because of it. You know, so I feel like, Suzanne, that's an amazing question. I feel like that's fantastic. And I, I have to agree. I feel like it absolutely does. I feel like maybe what it do will do is offer a little bit more um, as opposed to harsh punishment, more about another lesson to keep them from being in that same type of ritual. So it's absolutely. not letting them off the hook. It's right. just encouraging healthy growth. You know, I, I, yeah. I feel like kind of like maybe like uh, how do you teach lessons to a toddler? Right. Right. For forgiveness is such a that's a, a powerful word and yet so difficult for so many for so many reasons. I'm a big proponent of forgiveness, <clears throat> not just excuse me, <clears throat> let me do a proper clearing of my throat, not just for um, forgiveness of others, but forgiveness of oneself. That can be even harder. That's harder but, than anything else. I feel like that's the hardest thing you can ever do is forgive yourself or something mm, or a trespass. Right, right. But, you know, I, getting back to this whole idea of karma, I, I find it fascinating when we think of karma within the context, Raquel, of, let's say, a generational karma, something that's come through our ancestry. Um, and let's bring that word curse back into it. You know, I'm reminded of something, uh, a, a law of Newton's, I believe it's a law of motion where it essentially says what begins in motion stays in motion until something breaks it. So in bringing in this idea of forgiveness, could that be the conduit to break the, the, the literally that pattern of motion, that karmic motion or the motion of, of whatever it, malady, whatever it is we're dealing with, uh, things like forgiveness, but something has to stop it from being in motion. I'm going to take a sip of water because I'm, I'll let you answer. <laughs> Well, you know, I feel like being the change is really what stops emotion, right? If you actually change the pattern, then you change the path, right? So when it comes to those type of curves, if we can recognize what deed was done that caused a bloodline curse or bloodline karmatic, ancestral karmatic deed, you know, I feel like if we can bring awareness to what the problem was and be a voice of change in the problem, I feel like that is a massive resource. So yes, it is kind of like forgiveness, but if we're actually going to make a change and be the change in what may have happened several bloodlines back and mm -hmm. we can actually move that forward, then it definitely changes and stops that Newton's what's in motion. Because if we change the pathway, then we can create a new path and we can mm -hmm. create a new legacy. And um, I don't know. I, I still feel like we need to talk a little bit about this Kennedy stuff. I don't know why I just had to bring it back up, but I'm like, okay. Well, maybe it's time to go there. Well, <laughs> look, th th this whole idea, we're going to go there. We're going to talk about curses. And again, before we, before we delve into that, this is the thing that to me is the most perplexing, but important. And that is to understand, they say that my mother used to say, you can't fix a problem unless you get to the root, you get to pull it up by the root. And in like manner, I would say, how can we clear the karma unless we know where it started? So how important do you think it is for any individual that may realize that there's a there's a karmic curse, we'll call it that, ancestrally, to be able to really put their hands on where it started? Where did this whole thing start? Who did it start? Details here. Education is so important when it comes to how you're going to facilitate change, because how are you supposed to know what you're supposed to do and what direction you're supposed to take something if you don't know where it started and what the root cause was? Because the idea of cutting that karmic tie is going to be have to go into the inconvenient truth of one's past and one's family's past. You know, what someone did in 100 years ago doesn't represent who you are now, you know, because you can be the change in that family to make the difference. But then again, we also have to go to the root source of the problem. Like you said, you get it at the root. You do your education. You go to the uncomfortable factors that may have happened in your family's history. And you make a positive change regarding that mm -hmm. factor. And you make contributions. You make changes. You make you bring awareness to it. Not saying, hey, my family did this. No, 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 no. It's about bringing awareness that it was wrong. And we want to make a change. And you facilitate some type mm -hmm. of change. 
But this is where the, the, the brilliant work of, of what you do comes in, right? Because obviously the person that, that maybe has a sense that there was an ancestral tie here needs to find out those details. And you are the type of person, correct me if I'm wrong, that can bring those details on occasion. Yes? Yeah. I, I will have to agree with that. You know, I'm not trying to like pat myself on the back or anything, but I feel like that was a very self gratifying. Yes, uh, someone like me who works in the field that I do can definitely bring in the necessary details to be able to educate you on what needs to change and what needs to happen to be able to break those type of curses. And what happened though, right? Let me give you an example. I have a, I have a story. I'm not going to use a person's real name. It's somebody that I know. She is of um, Egyptian heritage. Uh, I call I was going to say, we'll call her Lisa. I call everybody Lisa that I don't want to use her real name. We'll call her Kim, Kim, but she is, she is of Egyptian heritage. And Kim told me a story quite a few years ago about a situation that her family uh, had gone through where the sister, younger sister in particular had been visited by shadow beings and other uh, malevolent, frankly, not benevolent, malevolent and, and more than trickster, but rather dangerous uh, uh presences in her room. Oh, they've gone through a whole litany of things. The whole family has. Well, the father recently died and I learned from Kim. She told me a little backstory about where all of this havoc had been, she believed had been coming from because not only her sister seemed to be getting the brunt of it, of, of, of the, of the activity, but the whole family has gone through stuff. But she found out that it, well, I think what happened was she, she found after her father passed, she found a book that belonged to her grandfather, her paternal grandfather. And that book was a book of curses that she found out were used readily by the grandfather to do a number of things. So she started putting the pieces together and determined that there was a lineage of spell binding, spell making. And, you know, in the, in the Middle Eastern culture, they take that very seriously. They may call it by different names, you know, but it's it's taken very seriously. So this is an example of a, a very intentional uh, a karmic building pattern that came two generations ago that she learned about. But two generations later, they're reaping the consequences she felt of th this repeated practice of black magic, essentially. Comments on that? Well, they always say that magic comes back to you three times full. So if you're putting negativity out there, negativity will be built up and put down. And if you're no longer here to reap that type of chromatic darkness, you know, it will wreak havoc on those that you facilitate or love the most or mm -hmm. in this line of uh, family lines, you know. So once you open that Pandora's box, it's just finding the right person to be able to seal it off and close it. You know, and how do you do that? You find a, a practitioner who's somebody who works in the lighter side of that same doctorate of magic and you work with them to go ahead and seal Pandora's box that was opened by her grandfather. So you would work with someone directly in line with the same type of magic, which I am a hundred I, I believe 110%. Um, but it does go back to the same thing about, you know, magic comes with a price, right? Magic will come back to you three times fold. And it is kind of magic's word of karma. You know, mm -hmm. what you put out there, you'll reap, but you'll not just reap in the same one to one ratio. You're going to, you're going to receive to one to three, you know, it's going to come back a lot worse and it is going to penetrate the family line. So in that area, I would recommend them going to someone who still practices the same type of magic on the lighter side mm -hmm. to be able to counteract it and also to um, change the essence of the flow of that negativity and go back to the curses that may have been sent out, you know what I mean? To spark a little bit of light in there, you know, because people are probably still being affected by these curses that the grandfather put out there, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so if we can work on going back to the origin of those curses and spark some light to counteract them right. at a distance. We're able to, stop them from reproducing and growing and keep going. Absolutely. It's snowball effect, I would imagine. If, yeah. if somebody's got to say the buck stops right here, we've got to we've got to stop this pattern. It's it's fascinating. And I think it's far more prevalent than we we uh give it oh, credit wow. for. I agree 110%. Absolutely. Um and those type of curse lines and bloodlines, we just have to facilitate and find out where they initiated from and for them to find that from their grandfather. They know exactly where it's coming from, what kind of magic was being used. So they're able to go and find the antidote to it. Right. Using the type of magic, but using the light side of it. There's always a light to a dark. Sure. No matter what we look at, 
you know, if science fiction has taught us anything or life has taught us anything, even karma, there's a light and a dark too, right? So everything mm -hmm. is that light and dark. If we can just put a little bit of light into that darkness, then maybe mm -hmm. we can go ahead and clear up the disease and absolutely the healing process. Wow. Heavy. I don't know where she is now. And I don't know that she was even seeking help. I think she was just doing a bit of self-investigation or independent investigation. Um, but yeah, but then I remember her telling me years ago that some of the craziness that was going on poltergeist activity up, up the wazoo anyway, mostly to her sister, interestingly. So yeah, let's go Kennedy. Since we're on that, on that path, you and I had a, whoo, Heck of a just short but interesting discussion about what you've understood. I mean, for, for those of you guys out there that may not know what we're talking about, I think a lot of you may that uh, this illustrious Camelot family that has been, um, you know, obviously led by our, our former president, John F. Kennedy here in the U.S. Uh, so many stories I won't go into, obviously, in the the the. The, the blessings that they've had and the curses that have been just extreme and uh, you know, there are a lot of theories as to where it comes from. Some say it was the the father, Joseph Kennedy, and his dealings in the uh, spirits business, the liquor business. Uh, I don't know a lot about it, so I'd be speaking out of school. But you had an, another theory as to having to do with the daughter uh, and what happened with her. Go into that a little bit. So um, she was, Rosemary Kennedy was born in 1918. And of course, into this illustrious family, she was the eldest daughter. Um, JFK's sister. Um, and she had some, you know, mental disabilities and she became very cantankerous and irritable. And in order for her to be kind of, I guess, shut down or hidden, uh, her father ordered a lobotomy when she was 23 years old. That was formed in 1941. And this left her completely incapacitated. I mean, she couldn't even formulate words. She had no more vernacular. She was pretty much a toddler at that age. And she actually lived the rest of her life in obscurity. She kind of like was taken away from her family and like distanced from the family. And for this, for having this smudge of mental disability on this beautiful Camelot family, you know, and later on in her life, Rosemary did visit um, the existing members of her family. So she wasn't always just completely shut out. But for her majority of her younger years and when the Kennedys were rising to power in this golden family, she was essentially hidden away in a woman's home in Wisconsin. And not a lot of people knew about her struggle until later. Um, and so if we're looking at that being an intense karmatic incident in someone's bloodline, I can definitely say it probably would lead back to Rosemary Kennedy putting a smudge on this beautiful family because she was who she was and she wasn't able to use her voice or be who she was because it was a blemish on this beautiful portrait. And so going back into that area, I mean, if I'm looking at the story and I'm thinking about how do we right the wrong with that type of karmatic incidents, you know what I mean? We really focus on reinstituting you know, facilitating mental health in this country or in the world, you know, that these people are not damaged, you know, they are still humans, they are still capable, you know, and so that's how I feel like, I mean, from my professional opinion, and how you would break that type of, I mean, that, that story brings a tear to my eye every time, like, I want to cry right now, because it's mm. so emotionally, absolutely sad that this person was removed from the family and lobotomized and put mm. away you know, um, so how do we change something like that? We stop, we stop demonizing people, you know, based on their mental capacities, you know, and seeing mm -hmm. and cherishing who they are as a human being and are well deserving to exist on the same plane as us. They're not a blemish, you know, they not are at all, not at all. Um, That's a powerful story. And you just, just thinking absolutely unequivocally. And as a matter of fact, those that have what we call so-called mental illness in that capacity, um, studies have been done to show that many of them are brilliant beyond what we call normal or stable individuals. So yeah, that was either way, that was a wrong action to take. But so you, getting back to what may have gone down here, because again, I, I had not, I was somewhat familiar with the fact that there was a daughter that was kind of obscure, she was not really known. Um, but I, I didn't connect dots in terms of even just thinking, could it be that the curse emanates from that? But you really feel that that was sort of a, um, that's what started that pattern or, of you know, just tragedy in this family. And was it her getting back sort of uh, psychically with the family? I mean, 
I don't know if it was back. I feel like it was just kind of karma because karma isn't about retribution. Once again, karma is a mentor. And what was done to her, mm -hmm. um, taking away her essence and really her personality um, intentionally to silence her, um, really just you just stole the voice of somebody that could have been helpful for the generations. Mm. You know? And even though obviously the Kennedy family already had a lot of dark marks outside of things besides misogyny and things of that nature. And of course, dealing with a lot of other things that were going on too as well. I feel like this black dot was so personal because you're essentially silencing your own child. You're taking right. a life away because it ruins your image. I can't think of anything else as bad as damaging as rejecting your own young. Absolutely. So yeah, it happens all the time, unfortunately. But you just said something, you just reminded me of something, silencing someone in your own family. When you look at that, particularly metaphysically, are you not in a way, in a sense, silencing yourself? And so the silencing, you know, energetically may have come through by you know, the killing of JFK and then RFK and then obviously the tragedy with uh, John Jr., although some argue, well, some argue that he's still around. We won't go there. But um, nonetheless, the tragedy of in, in myriad cases, there were individuals silenced in the Kennedy family, which reflects the intentional silencing of a member of the family. Do you get what I'm saying? That there could be some, you know, energetically linked even though in metaphor, very serious. Yeah, it's a very profound connection. You know what I mean? Just like the idea of silencing and having these three people silenced or, you know, a lot of the Kennedy family, unfortunately, still suffers from the repercussions of everything that will move forward. But the country suffered because of it, you know, but I do mm -hmm. yeah, about silencing. I think that that's a really great correlation between the mm -hmm. two. Yeah. And yet you look at other individuals, and again, please, we, we want to be really careful with this. I actually happened to know uh, the late Senator Ted Kennedy, and he was very kind to uh, my family. Um, that's not just, we're not intimating at all that everyone that's a part of this family, by a long stretch, are bad people, but may have gotten stuck in a cycle or been, been tethered to a cycle based on a deed that was done by an individual of the family uh, that did something that wasn't in the best uh in the best spirit of things. So I want to make that clear. But, uh, but, you know, as I think about generational karma, and particularly, we're talking about the Kennedy family, Raquel, and I think of somebody like, I'm, I'm thinking of someone that and I don't know what this individual, I don't know her personally, Caroline Kennedy, the sister mm -hmm. uh, of J of John Jr. And of course, the daughter of JFK, who seems to have I'm not going to say come through life unscathed because I don't know what she's been through, but at least from a public persona, she seems to have been unaffected uh, to the extent that we're familiar with in the Kennedy family. So the question I have is, are there some people that can circumvent karma? I feel like when it comes down to it, I feel like since she was um, the male were more of the ones that were held up to higher esteem than the females in that family, going back to like kind of the misogynistic area of things. I feel like, yeah, I feel like people are kind of spared from the heaviness or the weight of the curse hmm. moving forward, depending on who they were as a person, but also just their connectivity and who really was targeted by karma. If we're going to say <laughs> karma is targeting somebody. Um, so yeah, I do believe that people are kind of can be protective, almost like the story back with you were talking about with your friend with the, the one, one daughter wasn't really affected, but the other one was offended by it. Right. You know what I mean, I feel like absolutely. I feel like it definitely goes to a person who can make the most noise. Right. Because uh, change comes with noise, right? Change comes with someone who's actually going to make a difference or actually have the courage to be able to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And so the one that actually is going to make that profound difference is a person who has the loudest voice. Right. True. True that. Wow. Let's look into that more, the Kennedy, you know, we wish, we wish them the best, of course, I certainly do. And that's the other thing, even, even if you're aware of a lineage of not great deeds, you, you know, you're making judgment and, and casting, casting judgment and, and, you know, ill, ill thoughts mm -hmm. on them. Uh, I, I also look at the boomerang effect is, is not good for you or anybody. So uh, I do wish them the best because they've been through uh, some insurmountable nearly insurmountable tragedy so really awful yeah yeah and I think 
like the whole idea of just like making the change or using your, you know, your fame or your your platform as a way to make a change for mental health awareness and things like that mm -hmm. definitely would make a huge difference. But yeah, I mean, and I'm not saying that it has to go back to Rosemary specifically, but when we brought up the Kennedys, it was something that came through. And I say this with the most utmost respect, you know what I mean? It was um, the one action doesn't, I, I don't feel like equates to the needs of the others, but I also feel like there's an area where we can stand up and talk. Mm -hmm. you know, we can bring it back in, you know? So yeah, I, I feel like it's a very sad thing that any type of family would go through and we can't come at it with an idea of like full judgment and be like, this is, he was an awful man. Well, there was just an awful, there was just different practices at the time, but at the same time, it doesn't make the deed less worse. Right. No doubt. Wow. You know, we just change it. We right. make it a change. Right. Absolutely. All good things. All good things. Listen, before we close and oh, and by the way, you all know what the deal is. When I go like this, you know what that means, right? You, you may not know Raquel, but you're going to find out. We're going next door. We're oh, going yeah. next door in a few minutes. Guess what we're going to talk about over there, you guys, over on the Patreon after show. We're going to talk about is Mer Mercury retrograde. As we are recording this episode, we're what about, what's today? today we're about 10 days in-ish. Yeah. Something like that. So Started I yeah, I want to talk about that, but I want to kind of focus on some areas that uh, are ways that we might be able to harness. I'm always a glass half full person, you guys. You know, we look at that as having a negative connotation. It doesn't have to. So we're going to talk about that in the after show in a minute. But there are a couple more things before I let you off the hook. You slipped something in there about being a ghost hunter. Let's fold this into the work that you do as a psychic over at Psychic Source. Do you get people who are, let's say they're, they're feeling that there's an energy in their home, a ghostly presence in their home that need work on it. Are you able to sort of parlay what you do as a reader to your work as a researcher in this field? Absolutely. Um, but I do it more um, metaphysically, I guess, and then more just like research on the area. I kind of search out through spirit. They're like my, I guess you can say spiritual network, go through my mm. gut and they find out what's going on. And I can actually connect with the spirit in the home to find out what their deal is why are they there? Are they there out of anger? Are they there because it's their house? Are they there because they were just passing through? Is this somebody from family? So I kind of like go into the depths of the investigation there and find out who is walking in their halls. And mm -hmm. is it something that's related to them or is it related to the land? Is it related to the house? And then at that time too, as well, I can definitely try to circumnavigate and find out if I can evacuate said soul if the person is a little freaked out by their presence, or I just say, you know what, this person's not gonna leave, but here's how we can go ahead and coexist in this in this area, knowing better who that person is. So yeah, right. I do kind of investigate. It's just different, because when I when I do the ghost hunting, I definitely use um, physical tools, K, K2 meters, EMF detectors, thermal mm -hmm. imaging, you know, EVPs, anything that I can find like a very visual, like here is the person's voice on, tape which is absolutely fantastic what EVP happens. is fabulous it's fascinating and it's it been is. perfected well, not perfected but it's there's iterations of it that are really mind-blowing it's like one of the oldest things besides like the mirror and the eye that people used to use for like professional like they say that ghosts show up in your professional uh, peripheral vision there it is sorry words aren't working for me right now um and uh, <laughs> um you know i i get really i think i get too hyper excited when i talk about ghost hunting um but if it, it's come so far. So when I'm navigating it at a distance with a person who's on the phone or through chat, or even mm -hmm. during a Facebook live, you know, I get very excited because I can like disassociate, go there, find out mm -hmm. who is creeping down their hallways, and then offer a little bit more comfort for them, or say, hey, this is who you need to seek out. This is what you need to do. This needs professional help. I'm not gonna be able to handle this remotely. This is who you need to reach out to, or mm -hmm. it's your grandfather. Don't worry about it. He's just checking up on you. Just check, I, right. Like, so it's just about offering a person's peace. But yes, Absolutely. I do that on Psychic Source. It's, I love it. It's and like you get, okay. <laughs> I love it. Well, look, I'm, I, I don't know if you know, a lot of my audience know I do a show on the History Channel called The Proof is Out There. I'm part of the uh, member of uh, the cast. I'm a, a so-called expert, uh, expert part of the cast. And we've done a fair, I've done a, covered a fair amount of stories on uh, haunted locations, uh, usually with a twist. And I dare say that this idea of what we call hauntings or presence of other energies, discarnate energies are everywhere. They're absolutely everywhere. The intentions may be different. The manifestations or the activity may be different uh, for different reasons. But I think that it is, I mean, there's there's energy, intelligent, sentient energy, absolutely everywhere. It may be from a formerly human realm. It may be from a non-human realm. 
So uh, I find it it's still fascinating. It doesn't it doesn't make it boring at all because there's just and I've covered some a couple of doozies on uh, for for proof for proof is out there. So yeah, I love that stuff too. We'll be talking more about that. We'll be tough for sure because we're going to stay in touch. But listen, you all need. I'm looking at the audience. You all need to be in touch with Raquel so she can do a reading for you. And of course, I'm going to drop. Listen again. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Psychic Source. Let me do this. Thank you, Psychic Source, for the blessing of giving me an exclusive deal. I I got an exclusive deal. I told you all the last time, and it's still holding true. You can get 35 minutes, 30. It's it's really 30 minutes plus five extra minutes. So it's a total of 35 minutes for just 20 bucks. 20. That's it. 20 bucks. I know you're looking at Raquel's going, what? Where'd you get that that's from? Awesome. That's no, that's fantastic. I, I it's really a, yeah, it's a first time. It's for new members only. And uh, listen, once you get in the network, you're going to want to stay and work with people like Raquel. You know, I say that, um, Spiritual readings are really the new therapy for sure. But go ahead and try this out, you guys. Call them up today. Use the code Alexis. Of course, we'll have a link uh, down below in the show notes and get this reading and dig into all of these things uh, because it's it's worthwhile. I think th this is about personal transformation, whatever the case is. So uh, again, I want to thank Psychic Source for extending that that offer to our Higher Journeys audience. So very cool. So very cool. So yeah. Raquel, what's going on with you next, girlfriend, as we close out and get ready to go over here, over here? <laughs> I guess we're going into retrogrades. <laughs> we're going into retrogrades. Yes. Into retrogrades. I'm super excited. Let's, let's do give this. us a little teaser that we can carry over there. A little teaser. Well, a little teaser. A little teaser about retrogrades. Retrogrades mean things are moving backwards, which means that we are working harder to move forward. Mm. We're dip into a little bit of that there, too, as well. Make working it positive harder. and negative, right? right? Just working harder to get better. Working harder to you put our al alchemical skills to the test, I would say, and and turning the things the, the appearance of things moving backwards. Actually, it's really it's it's an optical illusion, but the effects are very real. I can tell you that for sure. Here's a little trivia for you. I think I told you, Raquel. I'll tell the audience. I was actually born during a Mercury retrograde, and I'm not going to tell you the year. Oh. Now that I'm not going to tell you the year, but uh, I was, and I think, well, there's a lot to that. Why don't we just take that over to, to next door? <laughs> Let's do that. Let's go this way. Yeah. This way over here. All right. Oh, that way. Sorry. <laughs> we'll, we'll end up in the same place. I have a feeling. <laughs> I don't know if this is... All right. Oh we're good. my God. Well, we'll meet you there. Don't worry. I'll, I'll get there. Retrograde. Okay. Right if I get there first, I'll just leave the door open for okay. you. And we have to leave the door open for everyone else anyway. So <laughs> listen, Love guys, you. this has been great. Raquel, thank you so very much, my dear. I appreciate you and you were so much fun and there's so much to learn. Again, I'm going to remind everyone, go get that reading. Get, get it with Raquel. They've got a fabulous network, but Raquel's done 50,000 plus. And I think she's got probably another 50 on tap coming up. So 50,000. So That's I hope you're one. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Well, listen, thanks once again, my dear. Thank you to Psychic Source and thank you, Journeyers, as always, for joining me. I'm getting hot. I don't know if you saw, I turned my fan on here. I'm not even going to try to hide it. I'm in the studio and it, yeah, it's still hot here in, in uh, South Carolina. So let me uh, go cool off. We're going to go next door. We'll see you next time. Much love. Talk to you soon.